Welcome to the CanMed Coffee Talk Lounge here live at CanMed 2022 in Pasadena, California. I'm Ben Amaral, host of the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast. And I'm here with Ethan Rousseau, our science keynote presenter here at CanMed 2022. Ethan, great to see you. Well, it's lovely to be here. I regard this as my coming out post pandemic. Yeah, and with that said, how nice is it to be back um, in person at a meeting like CanMed? And what are you hoping to get out of this event? Well, it's familiar but novel at the same time. Uh, we've all been cooped up for a couple of years. This would be my first in-person presentation, although we've made good use of Zoom uh, for presentations all over the world. Um, so, you know, I found out I don't have to be there, but I certainly wanted to be there for this. Yeah, and again, what is it about an in-person event that makes it better than, you know, Zoom, which we've been living with for the past few years? Well, you don't have the ability to network uh, on Zoom the same way. You know, it's not just the meeting, it's the uh, little get-togethers in a uh, uh, quiet room afterwards or dinners together. Uh, the chance to really get to know your collaborators, all that, you know, that's irreplaceable. Right. Yeah. The business really takes place between the talks. Sure. Excellent. And now, are there any presentations at this year's event that you're looking forward to? Oh, there's so many. Uh, of course, Professor Mishulam, uh, my spiritual uncle on all this. Right. Um, uh, Dustin Sulak, Bonnie Goldstein. Um, uh, yeah. Stacy Gruber, so many. Yeah, no, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I was just curious. And um, so your keynote presentation, it's titled Cannabis and Psychiatry, The Final Frontier. And um, I have to admit, I'm a little curious about the final frontier part, because um, certainly there must be some additional frontiers that we've yet to conquer with cannabis medicine. Yeah, there are. The other notable one would be the area of obstetrics and gynecology. Mm. Now, what they have in common is these were very... Uh, commonly uh, indications for cannabis-based medicine in the past. Historically, the literature from the 19th century and even before pointed to those areas as being ones where cannabis-based medicine was very effective. Particularly for psychiatry, though, um, it's sort of a forbidden territory yet. Mm. Same with obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, most psychiatrists are extremely conservative, uh, particularly about the uh, idea of a drug of abuse, i.e. cannabis, uh, that could be used therapeutically. But I think many of them are unfamiliar with the history. And they're also thinking in terms of what they've seen, which is really abuse mm -hmm. related to THC. But there's more to cannabis than just THC. Right. And the real uh, contributions are going to come from additional components uh, with maybe just a touch of THC. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. I mean, because obviously THC is the, the known psychoactive compound. So is that sort of essential to be um, uh, used here? No, they're preparations. For instance, there have been a couple of randomized controlled phase two trials of cannabidiol as an isolate. Hmm. Um, in uh, treating schizophrenia quite effectively. But the doses were so high, 800 to 1,000 milligrams, I think that we could do a lot better with less, right. making it more accessible and less expensive by having other components, particularly cannabigerol, which I'll be talking about oh. uh, in the keynote. Um, that's a component of great promise. Uh, and most people really haven't had access to it uh, let alone knowledge of its potential. Yeah. So is that an example where, you know, these additional compounds can sort of, um, when I, when I talked with Kevin Spellman about some of the pharmacology of, of the different compounds, he explained that some of them are almost serve as an icebreaker where they can sort of help with the penetration of the medicine. So is that an example of why, you know, the entourage effect is so important? Well, it's just one factor among many. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I named my paper Taming THC back in 2011 because that really describes a lot of what some of the minor cannabinoids and terpenoids will do is increase the therapeutic index of THC, making it a better more tolerable medicine. Mm. Excellent. Okay, and so 
I wanted to quote from your abstract here. You said that the endocannabinoid system has a critical ro role in neurotransmission in homeostasis of the limbic system. Can you speak more about how endocannabinoids and phytocannabinoids help regulate this important area of the brain? Sure, so the limbic system are the emotional centers of the brain, of course. And what we find is there's a very high density of the CB1 receptor where THC and the endocannabinoids and nandamide and 2-arachidonoglycerol work. Mm. So that, that was a hint. I mean, when this was established back in the 90s, it was obvious to some of us that, boy, there's a real target there. And this explains why cannabis could be so effective for a variety of psychiatric conditions. Um, and really, that's the foundation. Uh, then it just becomes a practical matter of what do you use, what's in it, what's the dose, um, where is it going to be most effective. Um, that's what I'd like to be working on, uh, you know, for the rest of my career. Right, you got to conquer that frontier, right? Hopefully. <laughs> um, and I did want to bring up, since we're talking about psychiatry, it's, it's becoming a bigger topic kind of in our circles, and we have a few presentations about it here at this year's CanMed, um, psilocybin and psychedelics. Um, what role would they play in psychiatry? Uh, again, great promise. Uh, there's been a resurgence of interest in the psychedelics, uh, just analogously to cannabis. It's been submerged for some decades because of prohibition. Um, but uh, again, I'd like to be a student of medical history. Um, back in the 50s and 60s, there was some tremendous research on psychedelics uh, for a variety of conditions, treating addictions, particularly alcoholism. Uh, intractable depression, end of life things, the same kinds of things mm -hmm. you hear now. Um, so it, it's interesting how there's been sort of a transition uh, from cannabis to psychedelics. Uh, and it may be that we've got uh, psilocybin or MDMA available uh, as pharmaceuticals before there's better access to a wide range of cannabis-based uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, it's not a competition. I'd like to see both. Um, uh, something I'd like to emphasize is most of the current research on psychedelics is focused on synthetics or sim single molecules. Um, I think that there's synergy in the psilocybe mushrooms and many of the other botanical sources of psychedelics and uh, I hope to focus more on those uh, rather than the isolates. Right. So again, the entourage effect. Uh, yeah. If it works for cannabis, it should work in this <laughs> realm as well. Excellent. Um, and so in your ab abstract, you also mentioned, you mentioned it here. Um, answering one of the earlier questions of there being a long history of using cannabis to treat mental conditions. What are some good examples of that? Well, it only goes back about 4,000 years. <laughs> you know, the Sumerians, uh, there was a listing of the attributes of what we believe is cannabis. I'm sure it is. Um, but one of the, the lines about this plant was for or against panic. And <laughs> that is a 4,000 year old demonstration of the biphasic dose response curve of cannabis, meaning at very low doses, it's great for anxiety. A, a dose that's too high and induces anxiety. Right. There it is, right there. So um, that's a blueprint for everything that, that came before and hopefully will come subsequently. Uh, another highlight would be um, uh, Jean-Jacques Moreau de Tour in France uh, in the 1830s wrote a whole book uh, about the promise of cannabis uh, for treating schizophrenia and other psychiatric conditions. Unfortunately, the tradition didn't carry through to the modern day, but right. we have a chance to right that historical wrong. Excellent. Okay, and just in closing, before I let you go, um, just curious that, you know, given that so much of the research that goes into medicinal cannabis is done by privately funded companies like your own, how important is it to come to events like CanMed and share that information with the community? Because not all companies are going to be as forthcoming as, as you and others. Well, again, you have to keep some things close to the vest in terms of development, uh, uh, like it or not. 
one has to have intellectual property attached to sure. be able to continue the work. Um, as it is now, um, we have found ourselves at Credo Science going uh, into a few tangents to try and support the operation. But we've got a lot of proverbial irons in the fire. Um, uh, but the chance to network, uh, again, is fundamental here uh, to see with whom you want to collaborate on whatever level who's got the novel extraction technique that might be ideally suited to the medicine that you're trying to develop. Right. Um, seeing what the markets are. Uh, it's always a matter of what, what are other people doing? Um, how can we either work with them or uh, maybe it generates a new idea you can take in a different direction. Um, so again, it's that intellectual interchange that's just fundamental to how science advances. Yeah. No, and that's one of the things we've noticed in the last few years, there being more sort of announcements of novel technologies or novel methods that, that go on at the event. So uh, we like to think that's the strength of the event. Hopefully. All right, Ethan. Well, thanks again for taking the time. Hope you enjoyed your time in the CAMED Coffee Talk Lounge and look forward to having a great event with you. A pleasure. Thank you.